Bible's open to Matthew 20. Uh, glad to see each of you here. Those of you online, glad to have you with us this morning. Um, some, some years ago, I was going to Nashville. I can't remember exactly why if I was picking up grandkids, but I was definitely going by Grace Community Church where our oldest son, Josh, is, is youth pastor. And I was hoping to at least get some time with the grandkids. But it's been a while ago. The church was in vacation Bible school, so it was in the summertime. And uh, I parked and went into the church, kind of educational into the building where Josh's uh, office is. And walked there to find him in his office. There's a great hallway that kind of spans uh, the, the whole width of the campus. And uh, so I was looking down toward where you would enter the, the worship center. And uh, so I look, I'm probably 120 feet, maybe something like that. And I see our daughter-in-law, Laura, and she's, she's at a resource table or something. She's got her, she kind of turned sideways away from me. And so I think there's Laura. And so I walk down there and I'm, you know, so, so I invade her personal space, appropriate distance for a father-in-law to a daughter-in-law. But so just kind of almost behind her, she's got her head turned so she doesn't know I'm there. I'm just waiting for her to kind of feel my presence and turn around and see me. Which she does, but when she turns around, I realize it's not Laura. <laughs> and so I am backing up, red-faced. This woman is thinking, who is this creepy old guy getting way too close to me? It was, it, it was not good. It was a case of mistaken identity. Um, now, I've seen that young woman a time or two since then. We've had a good laugh over it when we recalled that experience. And... Laura was a bit flattered that I mistook that woman for her, so, that, so it all turned out fairly well. You may have had some issues with mistaken identity. It's pretty, it's easier than normal now, isn't it? Because we've got half our faces covered and you're kind of like, is that, is it not? I'm not sure who that is. Um, when, you, when you read the Gospels, the issue of identity is, if it's not the key issue, it's really, really close to it. And as you walk through any of the four Gospels, especially the Gospel of Matthew, you'll see people understanding who Jesus is, and you'll see people who don't really have a clue about who he is. The, the really key issue for us is, will, will, we, will we understand that? Will we see who he is? And for some of you, that's the most important issue facing you this morning. Do you understand who Jesus is? And in understanding that, will you respond to him? in the appropriate way. Will you respond in repentance and faith? For, for others of us, we know who he is, but it's really helpful for us. Just part of our growth and our progress, our joy in the faith, really is rooted in, are we seeing his identity as clearly as we should? And as we grow in, our, in the process that would have us maturing as Christ followers, part of what will happen is that sense of his identity will grow in clarity over time. We'll see more and more clearly who he is and how he is. And so I hope as we, as we deal with this text this morning that the Lord will produce both of those things. For those of you that aren't sure yet who he is, maybe you come to understand it and respond to him in faith. And for those who know and have known it, maybe by God's grace, you just see that a little more clearly today than you have ever before. Now, now we're going we're gonna to divide the text three ways. We're just going to, there are basically three characters in the story. And so we're going to camp on each of the characters. The first is the crowd. The second is the blind men. And the third is Jesus. There really aren't any more characters in the story than those three. The crowd, the blind men, and Jesus. We camp on all three and try to draw out truth as we walk through the text that way. So first, the crowd. We won't spend a long time here. At least we don't need to. Verse 29, as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. So the first thing you see about this crowd is they're following Jesus. They're following him. That's a very good thing to do. We're not told exactly why. And uh, now, at this time of year, we're getting toward Passover. Um, we know that Jesus is, and this crowd, they're coming out of Jericho. So Jericho is to the east of Jerusalem. And Jericho is, the, is on the plain of the Jordan River. So it's in the Jordan River Valley. And on the west end of that valley, 
right at the foot of the mountains. So coming out of Jericho, you would begin to climb two or 3,000 feet up to Jerusalem, something like that. So, but they would, lots of people would be, would be going up to Jerusalem because it's Passover. So everybody goes to Jerusalem for the feast. So we don't know exactly, are they just along for the ride? It does say they're following Jesus. That's a good thing. Following Jesus is always a better thing than not following Jesus. But as you walk through this gospel, you see some people that follow him in a way that's really significant, and it is a declaration of their allegiance to him and their commitment to follow him with all their life. With others, it seems like they're kind of floating downstream with what everybody else is doing. I suspect with much of this crowd, it is that. That's the first thing you see about the crowd. Second thing you see is that they're rebuking. And so these two blind men are sitting beside the roadside. They hear that Jesus is coming with the crowd, and they start to cry out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And the crowd rebuke them, telling them to be silent. So this tells us a lot about the crowd here. So these two men, blind, in need, they're hollering out to Jesus, and the crowd rebukes them. This is really kind of similar to what we had a chapter or two ago. Do you remember when uh, the, the, the mothers, perhaps, were bringing their little children to Jesus to have him touch them and bless them and pray for them? And the disciples rebuke uh, whoever it is that's bringing these children. I like to think it's moms, maybe it's dads, maybe it's grandparents, but whoever it is, uh, or neighbors, but whoever it is, the disciples rebuke them. The, the master's too busy to deal with someone as insignificant as a child. That was their attitude. And you're getting the same attitude the disciples had there by the crowd here. He's too important. He's too significant. He's got bigger fish to fry than you. Or they're just annoyed at how much noise these two are making, hollering too loudly, shut up, be quiet. They're not, they're not looking at them as people. In the ancient world, there was no shortage of, of beggars. And there was no shortage of, of blind people or lame people. There was no shortage of lepers. And for many who live with those realities every day, I'm not talking about suffering from the realities, but live their life alongside of people suffering those realities, over time those people would begin to just blend into the landscape. They'd, they're no longer seen as persons. They're no longer seen as valuable. They're certainly not seen as image bearers. And those for whom Christ would come. And so the crowd rebukes them. And I just want to ask you, are the hurting blending into the landscape for you? Can you look on them with different eyes than the crowd looks on them? Can your heart break? Can you see every man, woman, boy, and girl, rich or poor, whatever ethnicity, whatever educational level, whatever gifts or lack of them, can you see them as image bearers that, that are enormously valuable? The, the crowd's missing that. They're following Jesus, so you would think maybe they would have some sense of who Jesus is, but they don't seem to. Now, if you've been reading Matthew's gospel, and we've been reading it carefully, we have a sense of who he is with respect to the downtrodden. We, 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 we've grown in our sense of that. And really in the sense that things really are flipped in the economy of the gospel. That the rich young man with hands full of the material goods of this world, he goes away sorrowful, really with hands empty of the most important thing without Jesus. But little children that have no rank, they leave with their hands full. The leper who's kicked to the curb by most people, he's brought to Jesus and Jesus touches him and he goes away cleansed. And so everything kind of tends to be flipped, doesn't it? So the crowd is typical. The crowd is typical of that day and the crowd is typical of our day. But loved ones, we must not be typical. If we're going to truly follow Jesus, we have to be people that see people for what they are. They're, they're bearers of the image of the God who made us, who made them. 
bearers of the image of the Christ who came into this world to redeem and save and heal and restore. We've got to be more like him. That's, that's the crowd. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Secondly, the blind, the blind men. Verse 30, And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us. So the first thing you see is they're sitting. That might not seem to be so significant, but they're sitting by the roadside. Now, lots of preachers for centuries have made much of what happens here, what happens with blind Bartimaeus in the Gospel of Mark, in the Gospel of Luke, what happens with Zacchaeus in this similar historical context. And, and what they say is Jonathan Edwards, Lloyd-Jones, lots of them have said it, you've heard me say it, is that you need to put yourself in the way of the blessing. And, and, and so if you find out that Jesus is coming by, you might want to just camp right on that roadside and just see that when he comes by, maybe he will look your way. You put yourself in the way of the blessing. And many, I read a book recently that, that made this claim. A uh, guy named David Mathis, book Habits of Grace. And he really says spiritual disciplines are that. Spiritual disciplines are a way for you to put yourself in the path of the blessing. They don't guarantee that you'll be blessed, but they put you in the path. They give you the opportunity. Neglect the disciplines, you can be pretty sure nothing's going to happen. Embrace the disciplines. Put yourself in the path in the way of the blessing where Jesus tends to show up. In some sense, you're doing that right now. Either gathered online or sitting in this pew right now. You're doing that. The Lord tends to show up when his people gather. And you put yourself in the way of the blessing. You can't guarantee it, but maybe. Maybe he will. Maybe he'll look your way. Maybe he'll touch your life in some special way today. Uh, and so they're, they're sitting there. They're strategically located, and you want to be that. You want to be strategically located. Some of you, I trust, are fasting right now. So you're a little hungrier than you normally are on Sunday morning because you forego, you forego breakfast and you're prayed instead of eating like, like, like we ask you to do. Or maybe you're about to do that with Sunday dinner or maybe supper tonight. Uh, but it's a, it's a way of putting yourself. Fasting doesn't guarantee anything, but it is a way of strengthening the cry of your heart when you, when you pray. When you feel hunger, it's good for you to want to be hungry for God or even for that to be real for you, that really you are hungrier for God than you were for breakfast this morning. You're longing to know more of Him, to experience more of Him. Or maybe as you feel hunger right now, you're thinking about those who are starved outside the walls of this church. They're without the gospel. They're without Christ. They do not know Him. They don't have a relationship with him. And they're starving for the knowledge of God. And you pray for them as you put yourself in the path of that blessing. Or you're praying, or your Bible study, you're listening to the word preached, you're engaging in the fellowship. All of those are ways for you to put yourself in the path. So they're sitting by the roadside. They're strategically placed. And that is a very good thing. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out. So they're sitting and then they're, they're crying. They're crying out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. So they're not just sitting there in the path, but they're calling on God. So some of you, you don't know Christ. You're in the right spot. You're listening online. You're in the pew and you're in a position where maybe the Lord would look your way. Maybe he would work repentance and faith into your heart. But I would say not just sitting there waiting for him to look your way, but maybe doing what these blind men did. You cry out to him. You call on his name. That's really the way the Bible describes prayer all the way through. The first time you see it, we've noticed this in the Wednesday night Bible study. First time you see it is the last verse of Genesis chapter 4. First time you really see Prayer. And it says, at that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. And, and what that means is, they're not just praying and calling, but calling on the name of the Lord means you're banking on his character. You have some sense of how he is. And in your praying, in your pleading, in your asking, you know that he is a God of great mercy. And, and, and you know that he's good and that he does good. And you know that he's wise. And he knows what's best and will do what's best. 
and you know that he loves the broken. And so out of all of that understanding of who he is, you cry out on his name, banking on his character, his goodness and his strength and his wisdom and his love. So they're crying out, and they're crying out loudly. Maybe that's, maybe that's as far as you need to go in this sermon this morning. Really, maybe that's the bottom line. You're in the way of the blessing, and you need to call on his name. You need to ask him. You know that Christ died for sinners. You know that you are a sinner, and you just need to cry out to him, Lord, have mercy on me. Save me. Help me to turn and trust and just call on him with all that you have and all that you are. So they're sitting and they're crying and then they're also seeing. And this is odd, but this may be the most significant thing in this entire story. They're seeing. Well, you say, well, they're not seeing, they're blind. Well, this is what's known as irony because they are seeing. Listen to what they say. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Now, who have you known in this gospel that has called Jesus Lord so far, who has banked on his mercy, who's called him son of David? Well, you haven't had much of it. The first time you have it is in late chapter 9. It's almost the end, it's the second to the last healing story of all those healing stories you have in chapters 8 and 9, right on the heels of the Sermon on the Mount. And there in that passage, you have two blind men, just like two blind men here, and they say, Lord, have mercy. They say, they, no, they don't say Lord. They say, they say, have mercy on us, son of David. So they know he's the son of David, but nobody else has said that. Another person, the Canaanite woman in chapter 15, she says, son of David. She's not even a Jew, but she says it. She sees it. Those blind men in chapter 9, they see it. These two blind men in chapter 20, they see it. But the Pharisees don't see it. If you go over to chapter 23 and you get Jesus' scathing rebuke of the Pharisees, he says, verse 16, blind guides. Verse 17, blind fools. Verse 19, blind men. Verse 24, you blind guides. Over and over and over again, it's blind, 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 blind. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, they're blind as they can be. And these two blind men, they see clearly. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Now, the reader, we're told who Jesus is from the very beginning, aren't we? Gen Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's Matthew 1, verse 1. So you're reading the Gospel of Matthew. It's declared to you by the Spirit who he is the minute you open the book. But as you walk through the story, you see some people who see it and some people who don't, and most don't seem to see it. The Apostle Peter saw it. Who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. He sees it, but Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood did not re reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So it was revealed to him. His eyes were open so he could see who Jesus is. So these men, though they are blind, they are seeing better than nearly anybody else. They're seeing. Not only do they say, Son of David, they say, have mercy on us. That's appropriate. So while it doesn't say they're calling on his name, they are. They're banking on his character. They know what it means to be Son of David, that he would, David was a king who was for the people, not a king who expected the people to be for him, but he was a king who was for the people, he had a heart of mercy. If they know anything about Jesus, they know that he's been full of mercy. You remember he's quoted Hosea 6.6 6 twice already in this gospel. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Blessed are the merciful, he said in the Sermon on the Mount. And then story after story after story, Jesus has displayed a heart of mercy for the broken and the downtrodden. Have mercy on this, us. The first two blind men in chapter 9 don't say Lord, but these two blind men, they say Lord. Now, admittedly, when you hear the word Lord in the New Testament, it can just mean something like Sir. It, it, it can mean something as simple as that. And in this context, it might make perfect sense. They're just showing respect and deference 
to Jesus, Sir, have mercy on us, Son of David. So maybe. But as you walk through the gospel, some people use this title for Jesus. One of the first ones to do it is the centurion in chapter 8. Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. He's one of the first ones to do it. A lot of people call him rabbi. Do you, do you remember what Judas says when he shows up with the soldiers? Do you remember what he says to Jesus before he kisses him? He says, greetings, rabbi. And then he kisses him. He calls him rabbi. That's what the Pharisees called him. Teacher. A level of respect, but nothing like this. But the first readers of Matthew's gospel, by the time Matthew writes this gospel and the churches got a copy of it and they got to read it and they heard it read in their gathering in their church, when they heard the word kyrios, they would have heard a whole lot more than sir. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's the word that's used to translate the word Jehovah or Yahweh. The Lord himself. And it's used of Jesus all over the New Testament. And so these guys are seeing clearly who he is. Do you see it clearly? Have your eyes been opened? And just on this Sunday before Thanksgiving, loved ones, we, we ought to stop here just a minute and realize that so many have not seen what you have seen. If, if you are a Christian, if your heart was opened up to respond to the gospel, if one day the veil on your eyes was, was lifted and you could see who Jesus was, and in seeing him, faith was created in your heart to trust him and to give your life to him and to follow him, then regardless of what else is going on in your life right now, you need to have a heart that's brimming over with gratitude because so many people never get to see what you have seen. And more than that, what you will see one day when you are face to face with him. You weren't born with eyes that saw like that. You weren't born with a heart that would just naturally believe like that. You, you weren't born with a heart that would just easily let go of your sin and chase after Jesus. You, you, you did not have that on your own. It was by grace that you saw. You know it, don't you? It's in the hymn. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found was blind. But now I see. John Newton knew it. He was blind. He was blind to the glories of his Savior. But one day the veil came off. John Calvin says that uh, men are like uh, men and women blind, blindfolded in a great theater. <laughs> Can you imagine that? That wouldn't be too smart, would it? To go to see a movie. Some of you are missing the opportunity to do that. To Go to the movie, but you have, your, you have a blindfold on. But he said that's what most men and women, boys and girls, are like. They're in this great theater that declares the glory of God, but they cannot see it. I was talking a couple of months back about one of our newer Christians in our church who's really loving to share the gospel and wanting to do it and is doing it a lot. And he was just telling me about his conversation with this young man. And he just, he just can't see it. I just, I want to say, why can't you see this? He's opening his Bible. He's talking to him about it. And the guy's just oblivious and blind to the realities that's so clear on the page to this one who's had his eyes open, but, but not to the one who's still blind. We ought to respond in, in mercy and love and patience and deep prayer for them. They're seeing. Have you been made to see? If you have, then be, be grateful. Be absolutely overwhelmed with gratitude that the Lord caused blind eyes to see in your life. And then, not only sitting, crying, seeing, but persisting. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent, but they cried out all the more. So the crowd saying, shut up, he's too important to mess with you. Leave him alone. 
or all this crying out is bothering us, stop yelling like that. Just give it up. He's not going to stop and spend time with you. But they don't just say, okay, and cower. They get louder, and they get more frequent, and they get more insistent. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. They get louder, they get more frequent. They persist. Can you persist? You ask for something one time? And you're like, well, that didn't work. Prayer doesn't work. Is that the way your prayer life goes? You know what is illustrated for us beautifully by this historical event of these two blind men. And did you know this is the last healing miracle in the Gospel of Matthew? This is the last one. You don't, don't have any other than the resurrection where Jesus is healed. But the last healing miracle of Jesus is, is this is the last one here. And it's placed right here before the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's, and it's so significant for us. They persist. They see who he is. They're banking on it. The crowd can rebuke them all they want, but they are not going to stop. They're going to keep hollering. They're going to keep asking. They're going to keep pleading. They're going to keep banking. Can you do that? And what you see here illustrated by this historical event, when you go to the Gospel of Luke, it's, it's taught us by two parables, one in chapter 11 and one in chapter 18. Do you remember the parable in chapter 11 of this guy who late at night has, some, has a friend show up and he needs to show hospitality, but he doesn't have any food, and so he goes and wakes up his neighbor and says, quick, give me three loaves. I need to be hospitable. I've got a guest coming, and i got nothing to give to him. And the guy says, leave me alone. I'm in bed. My kids are with me. My wife is with me. I'm not going to get up, put my feet on the cold floor, and go get you some bread. Leave me alone. But he just stays at it. He's impertinent. He won't leave it alone. And finally, the guy gets up and gives him the bread to shut him up. And then in chapter 18, it's the persistent widow of the judge who could care less about her. But she will not leave him alone. She's wearing the judge out. And finally, just to shut her up, he gives her justice. And Jesus says, how much more then? How much more then? Will your father give justice to his elect? And then he goes on from that and, and encourages us. That, we're to, that, that whole one, if I'm remembering right, it's set up by saying Jesus told them the story so that they would not lose heart, but they would keep praying. Do you lose heart in your prayer life? Or can you persist? They persist. I shared a while back about my mother's conversion who prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing happened. But she did not give up. It could be that way. It could be you've been asking, but you have not feel like you've been receiving yet. Don't. Don't give up. Persist. Seek the Lord. Don't stop. Maybe you're one you've been praying for, trying to share the gospel with, trying to build a relationship with, and it seems like the door slammed shut on you. Keep praying. Keep praying. One of the old Puritans said, sometimes, sometimes we lie beneath the sod before the seed springs forth. And sometimes it's true. Sometimes a lost person that you've been praying for, perhaps for decades, you go to your grave and go to your reward, and they get converted in response to your prayers after you're dead. But you don't give up. You persist. And so they keep crying out. They're, they're, they're persisting. And then, and then they're asking, and stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. They ask, they get specific, they get detailed, get like that, keep asking, calling out generally, but now, what do you want? Lord, let our eyes be opened. We need to see. Again, the irony here is that they're seeing better than almost anybody in this context, even though they're blind. And, and we know about that, don't we? Don't you think Fanny Crosby sees better than we do most of the time, don't you? Don't you think 
She does thou my everlasting portion more than friend or life to me. She's blind as she can be, but she sees better than we do. It's often that way. So they're seeing, but they're asking for physical sight. Lord, let our eyes be open. Be specific in your praying. You'll never know. You'll never know when you get an answer if you're not specific. If your prayers are so general, you'll never know when your prayers are answered. But if they're specific, you'll know if you got a yes or a no or a wait. I'm not yet. Lord, let our eyes be opened. And then finally, they followed him. They recovered their sight and they followed him. And while the crowd, we're really not sure about their allegiance, and they may be among the ones, this crowd going with Jesus up to Jerusalem, who cry out, you know, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and all of that, but also who are crying out, crucify him, crucify him a few di- days later. They may be that, but I don't, think these, I don't think these blind men are like that. They're following, following him in a different kind of way. Sometimes, loved ones, conversion is more than a decision. It it is. To truncate conversion, to say all it is is a decision, is to not do justice to what real conversion is. But it is never less than a decision. It is never less. You will not be converted without a decision to follow Jesus. And I'm not going to live life for myself anymore. I'm not going to keep going my own way. I'm going to follow him. Whatever it costs, whatever it demands of me, I'm going to follow him. I'm going to follow him. And maybe it's time. Maybe you've just been sort of sitting by the way, waiting for him to zap you, waiting for him to do something. And it's just time for you to say, okay, I'm following him. Whatever happens, I'm going to follow him. I'm driving a stake in the ground today from this day forward. I'm going to follow Jesus with all my heart. That's what they do. And they can see him. And they can see to follow him. And they do. Now, when you read the Gospels, you'll see examples to shun and you'll see examples to follow. And it's not all that difficult. It's not rocket science as Bible interpreters to figure out I need to avoid this example. I need to follow this example. And so this is not hard. Don't follow the crowd. Follow these two blind men that see better than the crowd sees. You, you, you can get that. But there's, but, but there's always more in the gospel than just an example to follow. And so the third character in the story and the hero of the story is, is Jesus. And so let's see what we get from him. First of all, Jesus hears. He hears. Now, it doesn't say that, but you know it it, it does because he stopped. So he hears. Now, I want want to ask if you've ever had this experience. um, So we have family gathering, and everybody's sitting around maybe the table talking. The kids have already scarfed down their food, and they're off playing somewhere, and the guys are talking at our house. It might be sports, it might be theology, it might be politics, or it might be some combination of the three where everything is politicized now, isn't it? So something like that. And, and all of a sudden, you see the women react, and the guys are clueless, but the women at the table react. They're not reacting to what the husbands are saying. They're not reacting to that. They heard the cry of a child in another room or down the hall or downstairs or even outside. They heard it, and you see Every woman reacts. They know and they respond to a distressed cry of a child, and they especially know if it's their kid. And the guys are clueless. I'm not saying that all guys are clueless, that I've never responded to the distressed cry of my child. I'm just saying that the women folk tend to have ears that are more tuned to that than the men do. Can we agree with that, generally speaking? Okay, no nods. That's all right. You know I'm right, whether you admit it or not. So... (laughs) I think Jesus has ears like that, you know. The hustle and bustle of the crowd, and there's so much noise, there's so much going on, but above it all and beyond it all and through it all, he's got ears that are attentive to the cries. He does. And his ears perk up, he hears. And I just want to encourage you in your prayer life that, that this is true. 
This is true of him. He has ears like that. And don't you ever forget it. Know that he does. Know that he hears. Know that he's not too busy. And so he hears like that. Now, we need to have ears like it. So Jesus is not just Savior to us, but example for us in this text too. So we need to be more like him, don't we? So we need to have ears that are attentive, that listen up when someone's broken. We need to be good listeners who can tell it. Who can tell when there's a little bit of hesitation. When we pass in the hall and we say, how you doing? And they say, good. And you just hear that little hesitation. We need to listen well enough to know that there's some hurt beneath that slow response to the passing in the hall question, how, how are you doing? That might necessitate me, rather than walking on by, stopping and trying to draw that brother out or draw that sister out a little bit. I need to listen better. Jesus hears, and he hears perfectly. And then he stops. He stops. He does. Now, he is a man on a mission, isn't he? I mean, where is he going? He's going to Jerusalem. What's he going to do there? He's going to die on a cross for the sins of the world. He's going there to bear our heavy load. And yet he stops. We've already seen this earlier, haven't we? You remember the guy who said, my daughter has just died but come and lay your hand on her and she will live and Jesus gets up and follows him he's not following Jesus Jesus follows him to go heal that herd and the disciples with him and behold a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment for she thought to herself if I only touch his garment I will be made well and Jesus turned and seeing her he said to the woman take heart daughter your faith has made you well he stopped. And here he stops. And it's like the whole world stops, because Jesus does. And all the momentum for chapters and chapters has been from, from Caesarea Philippi to Galilee to the Judean wilderness east of the Jordan River, across the Jordan to Jericho, out of Jer Jericho, beginning to climb up to Jerusalem. And all of it, all the momentum has been in that direction. And he just stops in the middle of that man on a mission. He's got time for these two blind guys. Which means he's got time for you. Which means he would stop for you. That you would have, that you would have his ear that you would have his undivided attention. You say, well, he might be responding to a billion prayers at the same time. That's true. But he is so amazing that he can give you undivided attention and a billion others at the same time. Don't sell him short. He can do that. Locked in on you. He stops. And then he engages. What do you want me to do for you? Don't you love that about our Savior? That he engages us? That he speaks to us and he asks questions and he does it from this word. He does it in a still, small voice. He engages. What do you want me to do for you? We have that from the earliest portions of the Bible, don't we? Cain, why are you downcast? Your brother's blood is crying out from the ground. What are you doing here, Elijah? You remember that one? Adam, where are you? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me more than these? He's an engaging Christ, isn't he? What do you want me to do for you? They said, let our eyes be opened. But not only engaging, he's pitying. He's pitying. I think Matthew's gospel, more than any other one, gives us a sense of the heart and the emotional content of Jesus' heart, that his heart will break for the hurting. You remember it? The bruised reed he will not break, the smoldering wick he will not snuff out. You remember, and when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Do you remember, come to me, all you who weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is, is light. 
It's a heart that breaks for the broken. There's a heart that will break for you of compassion and mercy. He will pity you if you'll come in your brokenness and bring it before him and tell him your trouble. You will get the same response. Loved ones, are you like this? Do you have a heart that pities the broken? Can you look on the harassed and helpless and have compassion for them? Can you look on the blind spiritually and remember when you were blind and have your heart break for them? So he's a great Savior who pities us and we should see that and come to him as he tells us to come and receive that easy yoke and that light burden. But we should also become men and women like that who pity the hurts and pains of others who are willing to stop our to-do list in the middle of a day and not be quite so task-oriented, but to be more relationally oriented. Somehow we need to be like him. He pities. And then he touches. He touches. You remember the sense of how the crowd parted so that the leper could come to Jesus? He doesn't say it, but we know it happened. They didn't have to press through the crowd. He didn't have to press through the crowd because nobody wanted to touch a leper. They would smell him coming. They would get out of the way. And they did. And he kneels before Jesus and he says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him saying, I will be clean. And everybody thought what would happen is Jesus touched the unclean so Jesus would be unclean. But that's not what happened. Jesus touched the unclean, and the unclean was made clean. And it's still happening today. It could still happen for you. If you just acknowledge your uncleanness, acknowledge your poverty, acknowledge your sin, and turn and ask him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean, will you? Blood was shed so that he could do that, so that his cleansing blood would wash it all away, every stain. So turn to him and trust him. And then finally healing, finally healing. And immediately they recovered their sight. And those spiritual eyes that were already seeing now owned physical eyes that would see as well. Now in this story what happens is Jesus is, Jesus is showing them what he just told them. You remember what happened? The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And you go right into this story. Jesus just said this. He declared this about himself. And then from that immediately he shows it. He demonstrates it with the touch and the healing and the stopping and the pitying and the hearing. And it's a word for us to keep bringing our troubles to him, to keep banking on his love and his listening and his pitying and his touch and his restoring. And then to go out into this world even this week and follow him, maybe this afternoon, feeding those that come for a Thanksgiving meal, maybe, maybe in praying this afternoon, but whatever that looks like and following in his steps, of being men and women, boys and girls, of compassionate hearts, willing to stop and listen and touch and seek the restoration of those around us. Letting him serve us in the gospel and then from that being a servant to everyone the Lord puts in our path. Let's pray together. Lord, would you uh, touch us as you touched them? By the power of your spirit, Lord, we need your help. Thank you that you long ago, for many of us, made our blind eyes see. Lord, would you do it again, even now? Open eyes to see you more clearly. Open eyes to see who you really are. And grant them repentance unto life and faith in the Lord Jesus. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.